You know, in introducing um, Maureen Corrigan, I, I'd like to make several uh, observations a, a, at the outset. First, um, it takes some courage for anyone to write a book. A second, it takes added courage if you're an esteemed NPR book critic mm -hmm. who, <laughs> whose day job is to judge other people's uh, books. And third, it takes still more courage to choose as the subject of your book the work considered by many, Maureen included, to be the greatest American novel, The Great Gatsby. Um, now, how many of you out there have read The Great Gatsby? <laughs> right. Well, that's really, that's really, that's very reassuring because our, our chief book buyer this evening suddenly, suddenly started worrying, oh my God, what if they also want to buy The Great Gatsby to go read? <laughs> and I said, don't worry, Mark, you know, I'm sure they all have copies at home or their kids have copies at home because certainly F. Scott Fitzgerald's uh, book is one of the most widely read American classics today, uh, a staple of, of high school English classes. Uh, but in, in her new book, So We Read On, Maureen discusses Gatsby less from the vantage uh, uh, of a critic than, than as, as a teacher, which of course she also is. She has a doctorate from the University of Pennsylvania and teaches at Georgetown University. Maureen truly loves Fitzgerald's book, and this clearly comes through in her effort to explain both why The Great Gatsby came to be and why it endures. Her, her book is uh, not at all a stuffy academic work intended for scholars, but a lively, accessible, witty, and very personal assessment. As a reviewer in the Washington Post remarked today, Maureen's book is, quote, as pleasurable to read as Fitzgerald's. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Maureen Corbin. Thank you so much, Brad, and thank you, the hometown crowd, and I hear you've been drinking, so this should be, this should be a good night. <laughs> um, this is my copy of The Great Gatsby. It's, don't be afraid. We're not going to go through all the <laughs> It's not the copy that I had in high school, uh, but that's where I first read The Great Gatsby. And I'm guessing that for most of you, that's where you first read The Great Gatsby. Teaching English at Georgetown all these years, I, I can tell you that Gatsby is the one novel that you can assume most entering freshmen have read. Um, after that, it splits apart, you know, To Kill a Mockingbird, Catcher in the Rye, Invisible Man, Moby Dick with a few students. Far and away, Gatsby is the novel. And in that sense, it's the novel that unites us as Americans. If we've got one novel in common, it's Gatsby. Um, when I first read Gatsby, I didn't like it in high school. I thought it was a boring novel about rich people. And then I had to go on and teach it in grad school and teach it, you know, in my first jobs as a professor, right? And I fell in love. I started to fall in love. And I think I've read it now absolutely over 50 times. I've gone to see Gats, the seven hour production of The Great Gatsby off Broadway uh, twice. I've traveled the country for the National Endowment for the Arts Big Read Project, uh, lecturing about Gatsby in places like Bowling Green, and I played Peoria. You know, <laughs> what happened to me, you know, a former high school idiot, is what happened to America, broadly speaking, in the late 40s and 50s. America reread Gatsby and was bowled over. That didn't happen the first time. When Gatsby came out in 1925, I mean, the famous headline from the New York World was Fitzgerald's latest, a dud. Um, <laughs> the novel was published. It got some great reviews. People like Gilbert Seldes, T.S. Eliot, Gertrude Stein, you know, the high art folks liked it. The ordinary reviewers gave it mixed to negative reviews. And by the time Fitzgerald died in 1940 in Hollywood, remaindered copies of Gatsby were still moldering in Scribner's warehouse. That's where Gatsby was. But it, it, it came back. I wanted to find out in this book, first of all, how that happened. And it happened pretty quickly after Fitzgerald's death and why that happened. How do books come back? and especially this book. How, how do books come back and become the central book, <laughs> the central novel for America? 
Um, I wanted to find out why Fitzgerald wrote it and how he wrote it. And I wanted to delve deeper into the mysteries of a masterpiece because I do believe in words like masterpiece and I do think that we can delve deeper. We don't solve the mystery of, of a great book like this, but we can delve deeper. To do that, I, 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 I read closely, but I also went on the road. Um, I went to Fitzgerald Archives in South Carolina, where I found an uncollected a letter that Fitzgerald wrote about the Great Gatsby in 1924 from Great Neck um, that's in the book. I, I went to Princeton, of course, which is the mother load of Fitzgerald stuff, <laughs> archives, letters, everything, you know, the, the painting, the painting, the famous uh, Francis Cougat painting that became the book jacket cover for the Great Gatsby is at Princeton's library. And boy, when they wheel that thing in and you sit there next to it, it's like somebody just wheeled in the Statue of Liberty. You, you can't concentrate, it's this icon. Um, I went with my family on the Great Gatsby boat tour of Long Island Sound, a floating tourist trap. <laughs> but it was fun. If, if, if like me, you're at all geographically challenged, it's really helpful to see, oh, East Egg, West Egg. And it's still there, that geography. And there's still the rumors about people's mansions. Adam Sandler supposedly bought his parents this giant mansion you know the guy who owns Arizona iced tea he's got a mansion at the tip of East Egg it's wild um, scariest of all I went back to my old high school something I have not had the inclination to do in almost 40 years but my high school is in Astoria Queens which is in the novel and I wanted to go back to the school which is in the landscape of the novel and and sit in on classes and, and hear what those kids were saying about Gatsby. I went back a couple of months right before the Baz Luhrmann movie came out, so that was fun. And my old English teacher is now the vice principal of the school. I think she was like 22 when I had her. <laughs> and it, that was just fantastic. She remembers everybody, so that was wonderful. Um, I wanted to do all of that and, and really, kind of, as I say, delve more deeply into the novel. One of the things I really wanted to explore is is what a weird novel Gatsby is, <laughs> because it is. I, you know, you read it that first time, and maybe you think, oh, it's a love story, or it's about the American dream. Well, if it were if it were just a novel celebrating the American dream, Jay Gatsby would be alive at the end of the novel. He would be in his mansion with Daisy. He's not. He's floating in that swimming pool. More about that in a second, right? It's such a weird novel. One of the ways in which it's weird is that it owes a lot to hard-boiled detective fiction and, you know, think the later film noirs that were made from hard-boiled detective fiction. Um, get, Fitzgerald uses the word hard-boiled in Gatsby. When, uh, when Nick Carraway is talking about the uncle he supposedly resembles in chapter one, he says there's a rather hard-boiled portrait of him in my... Uh, parents studies like on page three hard-boiled was a term that came out of world war one uh, uh infantrymen used that word in reference to tough drill sergeants they were called hard-boiled fitzgerald loved mystery fiction he wrote mystery fiction his first ever story in high school was the mystery of the raymond mortgage as he later said he forgot what the raymond mortgage mystery was about as he was writing the story but he loved mystery fiction he would make these lists in adulthood for friends of his and even for the private duty nurses that you know saw him through his alcoholic um phases the lists are incredible of books to read. Everything, you know, the Odyssey, all of these high art books. And he's always got Dashiell Hammett's The Maltese Falcon on it. They were mutual admirers. Chandler admired uh, Fitzgerald, too, very much. Fitzgerald was in New York in the teens, in the 20s, when what we know as hard-boiled fiction, this tough American private eye type fiction, even if you don't know the term, you know, you know what I'm talking about. It's that private eye in his office on a rainy night, 
drinking and a dame <laughs> comes through the door. It's slangy. It's tough. It looks at the seedy underbelly of American life. There's so much in, in Gatsby that owes imagery, language, the plot to hard-boiled detective fiction. Um, it's obsession with cars, Gatsby's obsession with cars. If, if any of you have seen Double Indemnity, you know what I'm talking about. Women driving automobiles, women in the driver's seat, always a scary image for, for detective fiction and film noir. Uh, <laughs> yes. uh, the, as I said, the language, the violence. Many of the contemporary reviewers in 1925 reviewed Gatsby as a crime novel. And when it was made into a movie in 1949, the second Gatsby movie, Alan Ladd starred in it. And it's, it's very much a film noirish movie. The first shot you see of Gatsby, Alan Ladd is Gatsby. He's machine gunning down his rivals in the bootleg business. So it's a tough film. Why does it matter? It, it matters because like hard-boiled detective fiction, like film noir, Gatsby is a retrospective novel. Everything that takes place in this novel has already happened. Gatsby is dead when the novel opens. And that means nothing can be changed. So what a weird structure for our great American novel. We're the folks who are supposed to believe in possibility, you know, in endless potential. But here's possibly our greatest American novel, and it's telling us that the future is foreclosed, that nothing can be changed, that everything that happens has already happened. So already Gatsby has that negative note to it in terms of reading America. It's a very weird novel because it's so over-designed. Uh, Jay Gatsby and Daisy Buchanan, you've read it, so I don't need a plot summary here. They, they're reunited in the dead center of the novel in chapter five. There are 450 time words in Gatsby. This is a very time conscious novel. It's aware of a deadline, ultimately. It's aware of time running out. You know the color symbolism, the green light, all the symbolism about eyes, uh, weather, direction, classical imagery. I could go on and on. It's so over-designed. Every chapter is arranged around a party hmm. until you get to the final chapter and the failed party of Gatsby's funeral. Um, it's so over-designed, and yet, as Jonathan Franzen has said about it, when you read it, it's like you're eating whipped cream. You know, you're, you're not constantly nudged in the ribs and say, oh, here's a symbol, here's a symbol. Maybe the eyes of Dr. T.J. Eckelberg. <laughs> but for the most part, you, you, it reads so naturally. And, and I, I, you know, I, I try to figure that out. How does Fitzgerald get away with it? How does he say something so big about America in such a short novel and so elegantly? For me, the biggest symbol is not the eyes of Dr. T.J. Eckelberg. It's not the green light. They're, to me, th those are not the most important. They're important, but the most important symbol is the imagery of water. Like so many of our great books in America, this novel is obsessed with the fear of going under, the fear of drowning. And you think about that first image that you have of Jay Gatsby at the end of chapter one. Nick Carraway sees him in the distance, in the dark, on, on the lawn, Gatsby is reaching out toward the green light. And Daisy's dock, he's reaching out. But what is he reaching out over? The waters of Long Island Sound. And if he reaches too far, he's going to fall in and go under, which he symbolically does when we see him dead in the swimming pool. He's in water. I wanted to just read you a, a, a short section about water in Gatsby and water in, in uh, our great American novels. The great theme running throughout all of Fitzgerald's writing and his life is the nobility of the effort to keep one's head above water despite the almost inevitable certainty of drowning. While the name of the hero in Fitzgerald's last completed novel has always struck me as comic book silly, Dick Diver bluntly spells out what Fitzgerald's work is all about. 
his best characters dive into life with abandon and then must fight to stay afloat. By the end of their stories, they're almost always going under, if not altogether sunk, weighted down by money worries, overwhelming desire, the burden of their past. The upward arc of the dive is all about aspiration, and it's glorious. Think of Gatsby flinging himself into a frenzy of parties and home redecoration in order to win Daisy back. Like the high-flying Gatsby, Fitzgerald himself started out by aiming for the silver pepper of the stars. Indeed, Fitzgerald recorded in his notebooks that his very first word as a baby was up. But what goes up must come down. Sink or swim, it's the founding dare of America, this meritocracy where everybody, theoretically at least, is free to jump in and test the waters. The fear is, however, that if you don't make it, you'll vanish beneath the waves. So much of American literature is saturated with images of drowning, dissolving, being absorbed by the vastness of the landscape or crowds. It's our national literary nightmare. Need I do more to start off the soggy great books parlor game than mention Moby Dick? We spend so much time on our initial high school forays into Gatsby, focusing on those look at me symbols of the green light and the eyes of Dr. T.J. Eckelberg that we overlook the most pervasive symbol of all, all, water. Permit me then to begin this voyage into Gatsby by retrieving some of the crucial messages about going under that inform Fitzgerald's anxious masterpiece, Almost every page of the novel references water. Go home tonight and look at it. I, even the briefest summary of its plot is soaked to the bone. James Gatz is born again as Jay Gatsby through a watery rite of passage on Dan Cody's yacht. He drowns symbolically in his pool when his dreams spring a leak and he can no longer float. Page for compact page, The Great Gatsby may be our dampest exemplar of the great American novel. Fitzgerald didn't just stick his toes in the water here. In this, his most perfect meditation on the American dream and its deadly undertow, he dives in and goes for broke. And if, if you think about that, re that reunion that I mentioned in chapter five between Gatsby and Daisy, I bet a lot of you will remember it's raining that day. And when Gatsby appears at the door of Nick Carraway's cottage, usually people laugh at that scene. It seems like it's played for laughs a bit, but he's soaked. He's already fallen in. And think about how Daisy is described. She's not described anywhere as a knockout in the novel. What's her big attraction? She has a voice that's full of money. It's her voice, like a siren from classical mythology, these creatures who sing to sailors and pull them under to their deaths by water. So it's, <laughs> it's loaded, it's wet, it's such a damp novel. Um, I wanted to think about other things too, as I said, and one of the big things I wanted to think about was the comeback. How did Gatsby so quickly get resurrected after Fitzgerald's death? One of the things that I didn't know that much about going into this book was one of the great feel-good stories in the history of American letters, and that is the Armed Services Edition program during World War II. During World War II, a group of publishers, paper manufacturers, authors, booksellers got together in New York, and they, they were strategizing how do we get books to soldiers and sailors overseas and into the prisoner of war camps in Germany and Japan through a program with the Red Cross? They came up with these armed services editions. My father was in World War II on, in the Navy, and he always told me about these funny paperbacks that they had during World War II. When I started researching Gatsby's comeback, I found out what he meant. They looked like this. This is a a catalog for an ASC exhibition that the University of Virginia had years ago. They were meant to fit in servicemen's pockets, printed on cheap pulp paper. They were meant to last about seven through seven readings. 
this group, this committee of publishers, et cetera, who got together, selected everything from Moby Dick to the Odyssey to um, the latest Rex Stout mystery to my friend Flicka. Uh, you can't, coming of age in Samoa, the servicemen were bombarded. I mean, they were a captive audience, right? With all of these books. When you read letters, as I did, from servicemen who wrote later on about what the ASC program meant to them, you do tear up because these guys talk about being on these Pacific islands and having a plane go by and drop a shipment of ASCs, the Marines crawling through the mud to get a book, right? If you love books, it's just, you know, this image. Gatsby was chosen for the ASC program in 1945. The best of my detective work suggests that it was the manager of the Scribner's bookstore, Nicholas Reedon, who was on the committee, who, would, who, who uh, chose Gatsby. So the ASC program distributed over a million books. They printed 155,000 copies of Gatsby and distributed them. That's 1945. After the war, we get the paperback revolution. We get early TV that picks up on Gatsby and does Gatsby. And eventually, we get it infiltrating, of course, into college and, and high school classrooms um, with the help of, of some critics who were good friends of Fitzgerald's who push it along. Fitzgerald, of course, was dead by then. Um, he knew none of this. And, and that's, you know, that's one of the heartbreaking aspects of this whole larger story of, of Gatsby's comeback. Fitzgerald died in Hollywood in 1940. He was 44 years old. And so I, I wanted to read you a little bit about his Hollywood years as, as an end to this program. And since you've all read Gatsby, and we can talk about Gatsby after that. But here's... Um, Here's Fitzgerald. Um, there's a story about his Hollywood years that I can't get out of my head. Shortly after Fitzgerald met Sheila Graham in 1937, he read in the paper that the Pasadena Playhouse was presenting a stage adaptation of his short story, The Diamond as Big as the Ritz. Fitzgerald decided to put on the dog. He called the Playhouse, announced that he was the author and reserved two seats. He also reserved a chauffeured, li chauffeured limousine and took Sheila Graham, who he was living with, in evening clothes, out to dinner and to the theater. When they arrived, no one was in the lobby. It turned out that some students were performing the play in an upstairs hall. The upstairs hall was pretty empty too. Just about a dozen or so casually dressed people mostly the players' mothers, it seemed, in the audience. Afterward, Fitzgerald went backstage to congratulate the student players, later telling Sheila Graham, they were nice kids. I told them they'd done a good job. Anyone who loves Fitzgerald can't help but wish that he could have had a glimpse into the future. Just a couple of decades beyond his own death, he would have seen crowds of students much like those Pasadena amateur actors reading The Great Gatsby in college and high school classrooms across America. Further on, he would have seen several more Gatsby films, the operas, the ballet, and Gats. He would have seen volumes of criticism and biographies towering in piles big as the Ritz. And he would have seen the money, how he would have reveled in the money. But Fitzgerald saw none of that. In the late 1930s, he drew up a three-page list for Sheila Graham, this is in Princeton's library, of, quote-unquote, possibly valuable books in his library. The list included a first edition of The Wasteland and notes on his personal copies of his own books. At the end of page three, he writes, probable value of library at forced sale. $300. Fitzgerald's last royalty check was for $13.13. And as his young secretary, Francis Kroll Ring, remembered, when that final royalty statement came through from Scribner's, and this is Francis Kroll Ring writing, the handful of sales proved that the author himself was the only purchaser. He told me about it laughing bitterly. 
I say, no wonder parents want their children to become doctors and lawyers. <laughs> in May of 1940, Fitzgerald wrote a letter to Max Perkins, his editor, in which he abruptly detoured from updates about his work in Hollywood to talk for two paragraphs about Gatsby. I think it's one of the saddest literary letters ever written. As so often happens with Fitzgerald, though, there's also that eerie quality of prescience. And this is the letter. I wish I was in print. It will be, an, it will be odd a year or so from now when Scotty, his daughter, assures her friends I was an author and finds that no book is procurable. Would the 25 cent keep Gatsby in the public eye, or is the book unpopular? Has it had its chance? Would a popular reissue in that series with a preface, not by me, but by one of its admirers, I can maybe pick one, make it a favorite with classrooms, profs, lovers of English prose, anybody, but to die so completely and unjustly after having given so much. Even now, there is little published in American fiction that doesn't slightly bear my stamp. In a small way, I was an original. Mm. He was. <laughs> he was. Thank you. Thanks for coming out tonight. Thank you. Thank you. So if you have questions, I think they do want us to want you to come up to the mic, if you wouldn't mind. Am I up? You are up. OK. <laughs> I am a veteran of World War II, and I did read the Arm, Armed Services, Armed yeah. Forces, whatever it was, series. The one I remember in particular had nothing to do with Fitzgerald. It was a group of clever poems, sort of Ogden Nash-like, yeah. by uh, Stephen Vincent Benet, as yeah. I remember. But I did carry all my, during all my service period. I didn't go in until early 44 because I was born in 1925. Mm -hmm. uh, I did carry the Viking Portable Library Fitzgerald mm -hmm. and the same one of Hemingway. Now, with regard to his, what should we say, resuscitation? <laughs> Some uh, people say it wasn't a resuscitation because he was never suscitated, or yeah. Gatsby was never suscitated in the first I've place. Always considered that it was Arthur Meisner's biography, the biography of The Far Side of Paradise important. that really kicked yeah. it off. Yeah, that's... Which came out, what, about 1950? 1951, 52. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, it's Meisner. It's Fitzgerald's friends in, in the world of American literature. It's Meisner. It's Alfred Kazin who brings together this collection of critical essays, which are, which are beautiful um, by many of his friends. Malcolm Cowley. Right. And, and, of course... Chief of all, Edmund Wilson, who went to Princeton with him. He was a couple of years ahead of Fitzgerald, and he um, brought out an edition of The Last Tycoon and, you know, really tried to keep Fitzgerald before the public eye. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. So oh. it's, 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 it, I, what I try to do in the book is to, to look at how these kind of literary friends in prestigious cultural places try to keep. Fitzgerald alive right. after his death, but then how also from the ground up how it happens. Uh, and the ASCs are so important. By the way, if you're interested in the ASCs, uh, our Library of Congress has the only complete collection, something like 1,332 titles. And anybody can go in there, taxpaying American citizens or others, and, and, uh, and look at the ASCs. It's, it's kind of thrilling. I just like to add that the ultimate revenge, I suppose, is just last Sunday in the in the uh, soft cover best-selling list. Guess what's what? what I know. Number seven I know. for the it's incredible. two weeks in a row. It's or incredible. Whatever, um, our book. I was in contact with one of Fitzgerald's granddaughters, Eleanor Lanahan, who was very generous to me in talking about her family and, and Gatsby, and she said that her father, who was on helped administer the Fitzgerald estate until his death, said even about 15 years ago, 20 years ago, eh, this is going to burst. It's, it's not going to last. <laughs> Gatsby is going to disappear. I mean, nobody could have predicted this. So. Can you oh, tell sorry. us about his uh, family background and uh, early history? Fitzgerald's family yeah. background? Yeah. Um, he's born 1886 to... Um, 
uh, family in St. Paul, Minnesota. His mother's family had money. Um, they they were the ones who had, as Fitzgerald you know, said, the cash, right? Um, but his father's family had what Fitzgerald called the breeding. Actually, Fitzgerald's father's family is from around here. That's why he's buried in Rockville, Maryland, because the family plot is out there. And his father went to Georgetown briefly. No record that he graduated, like as Fitzgerald didn't graduate Princeton. The thing that's touching and so important about Fitzgerald's family background is um, the parents never never owned a home. Fitz, Scott and Zelda never owned a home. They were renters all their life. The section of St. Paul where the Fitzgeralds lived was you know, a, a, a very nice section, but they were always you know, kind of renting the houses. They weren't quite in that society. And they depended on the McQuillans, Fitzgerald's mother's family, you know, f for a cash flow. In fact, Fitzgerald went to private school, St. Paul Academy, um, and then to Princeton, partly because of the mother's family's money, you know. So they were dependent on that. You always get the sense with Fitzgerald that he's kind of a bit on the outside looking in. So, and he, he says in one of his letters later in life, um, that's the story of my life. The, the scholarship boy at the rich boys school, uh, same at Princeton. Even, I, sometimes I even get that sense reading about the Fitzgeralds on the Riviera during the Gatsby years and after. He's hanging out with Gerald and Sarah Murphy and the Hemingways and all of that, but he's not quite comfortable. When Fitzgerald met famous authors and people he considered his betters, Edith Wharton, Isadora Duncan, James Joyce, even Hemingway, he's always kneeling at their feet. Literally, I mean that. He, he makes a big show of kneeling. In fact, when he met Joyce, he, he offered to jump out the window in admiration of Joyce's genius. And, and Joyce said that that young man must be mad, he said to Sylvia Beach, the owner of Shakespeare and Company, where this dinner took place. It's like he's always, you know, not quite there, not about, quite about, comfortable. How about early loves? Early oh, loves. well, just, have, just quickly. I mean, I talk about this in the book. And, and just quickly, I mean, I think the most important one is Ginevra King, uh, the, the girl who, she was 16. She was very wealthy. Uh, a Chicago area, fa uh, her father was in Chicago. The picture of their mansion looks like a department store in Chicago. Um, and she was dark haired like Daisy is. You know, in the novel, Daisy is dark haired. Fitzgerald met her when he was home at Christmas time um, when, when he was a sophomore at Princeton and she was visiting friends. So they met in St. Paul and he fell in love Mostly the romance, and she did too, mostly the romance was conducted through letters. But Fitzgerald went to visit Ginevra King once at her home in Chicago. And as the story goes, within his hearing, Ginevra's father said, poor boys shouldn't think of marrying rich girls. <laughs> you know, so it's perfect. So she's the one who got away in a sense. She's, you know, she, and, and he, says, he says in some letters that he used her over and over again. And certainly she's uh, um, an inspiration for Daisy. Yeah. Thank you for all. Thank you. Um, I was wondering if you had more thoughts on why the novel wasn't successful in the 20s, like if there's something yeah. about the society, like if they weren't yeah. ready for it and they were 25 years later. I'll tell you what Fitzgerald thought and I'll tell you what Max Perkins, his editor, thought. Um, they both worried that the novel was too short, that when people spend money on a novel, they want a big, fat novel, right? They're expensive, so it was too short. Fitzgerald said there were no favorable there were no likable female characters in it. And then as now, he, women drive the fiction market. So he thought that was a strike against it. He thought the title wasn't appealing. He never could settle on a title for the, 
The Great Gatsby. Up until the novel was published, practically, he's changing the title. And it's always a worse title. Tremalchio and West Egg, Under the Red, White, and Blue. I mean, the titles are terrible. Um, so those were some of the reasons he thought that it didn't sell. And I think he's, I think he's probably right. And I think also... You know, it, if you look at those er, those reviews of the time in the popular press, people are dismissive of it. They they talk about it as just like a crime story, almost like the way we sometimes dismiss detective fiction and crime novels as being second rate literature. They they weren't that impressed by it. But not that it was like too contemporary, like uh, too no. critical of society at the time. Or no, something. there's none of that in the contemporary reviews. Um, of the popular press. Mm -hmm. Folks like the critic Gilbert Seldes, who was writing then, um, uh, Gertrude Stein, um, T.S. Eliot, who read it twice when he got it, they sensed that there was something more in it. And they, they write to Fitzgerald about you know, his, his reading of American society. But you don't see that in the popular reviews. Yeah. Thank you. Well, thanks. Yeah. yeah, sorry. Hi, as someone who's had a chance to introduce Gatsby to a few students over the years, I wondered if you would talk a little bit about your experiences with Gatsby in Georgetown, and then also, fascinating with that going back to your school and having that oh, geographic. Yeah. Oh, I don't want God. you to give away all the secrets, but just <laughs> enough to, to let us know about that. Yeah, well, G Gatsby at Georgetown, you've got to overcome the fact that the, most of the students have read it already. Right. And that they're they're probably hoping that they can get away with not reading right. it again. Right. Not that uh, some of them are here tonight, so I'm not <laughs> insulting you guys. But yeah, um, but you know they've got a lot to read, so maybe they can let Gatsby go. One of the ways, one thing that tends to grab them is just is to tell them it's a weird novel. It's a really weird novel. It's not what you think it is. And sometimes what I've done is show them the opening of Billy Wilder's Sunset Boulevard. Remember that? I mean, the, go back, go and watch it tonight. If it's not for it, it's it's Gatsby. It's a voiceover, like Nick Carraway's a voiceover, and finally you get to a swimming pool, and there's a dead man there, and then you go back and find out how he became dead. Um, so sometimes that that intrigues them to think about these correspondences. I show them some of the stuff I have in the book, um, the 1926 silent movie of Gatsby, which is lost, but we've got the trailer, which I watched at the Library of Congress, has this, there's a wonderful glass slide that they used in theaters at the time. They would project the glass slide image onto the screen as like a coming attraction. And that is wild um, because it's, it's a, if I hold it up, it'll mean nothing, but it's, it's a, a slide of Daisy driving the car, and she's got this manic look on her face. Gatsby is like this, Myrtle's under the wheel. You know, it's just, it's like a, it's action-packed, you know, it's fun. And it, 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 it is three violent deaths, bootlegging, infidelity, crime. You know, it's, it, it's, it's certainly got that element to it. If you ever want to feel like the Crypt Keeper, go back to your old high school after <laughs> almost 40 years and stand in front of these classes and have your old English teacher, who looks fabulous, by the way, say, and I taught Maureen and she graduated in 1973. I mean, they look at you like um, you're King Tut come to life. And then <laughs> it's horrible. It's horrible. It's so it's it really is Freud's theory of the uncanny writ large. You're like, oh, my God. But the kids, once they warmed up, because that, you know, I was there a couple of days. And at first they were like, what is, you know, what was this? person who's gaga about Gatsby what does she want what does she want from us they were great you know they they also showed me something different um I you know I've been going around the country for years talking to mostly middle-aged and older audiences about Gatsby through the Big Read project and that's who shows up um so my rap has usually been, yeah, we read it when we're too young. You know, Nick's voice of regret and the nostalgia and the loss that pervades the novel, it's wasted on the young. But the kids at my old high school, they made me remember that there's a Gatsby for when you're 15, 16, 17, 18 years old. And it's that Gatsby about obsession. It's that obsessive love. It's, it's like... 
it's all or nothing. You've got to have Daisy. You've got to have um, everything that she represents or not. And they were so, they were, they were wonderful too. They were so fierce in their love of Gatsby and they did not like Nick Carraway. They thought he was passive and they thought he was a sellout because he shakes Tom Buchanan's hand at the end of the novel. But so I, they reawakened me to that intent, the intensity of Gatsby's feeling, and I like that a lot. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> and here's one of my brilliant TAs slash graduate <laughs> students who is quoted in the book, Annalisa Adams, because you, you've taught me a few things about Gatsby. <laughs> oh, I was actually, this actually piggybacks nicely off of that question, but I was just curious what your experience with sort of going back to for your high school and also to sort of the archival stuff yeah, with Gatsby is going to change about the way you approach the book with yeah. Georgetown freshmen or yeah. you know younger people. Yeah, the, the archive. I could still be in the archives. <laughs> uh, the archives are so seductive. Um, the archival stuff makes makes Fitzgerald come alive for me. Uh, I went to the University of South Carolina, which is. Almost, don't quote me, but almost more fun than Princeton. Because although Princeton has the Fitzgerald papers, the University of South Carolina has the collection of a professor, Matthew J. Brookley, who was an Americanist. And he got in, he got into to studying Fitzgerald early, and he also became friends with Scotty Fitzgerald, the Z Scott and Zelda's daughter. So there's a lot of stuff at the University of uh, South Carolina. One of the things that South Carolina has is Fitzgerald's briefcase from his Washington year, uh, from his from his Hollywood years, and there's a picture of it in the book. It's so touching because he's got his name embossed in gold on the briefcase and then his address. And the address is the address of the Scribner's building in New York. That's his only permanent address. I mean, that briefcase, you know, sums up what his life was like in Hollywood. He was always moving around. He was also being moved around by the studios to work on a picture for a week, two weeks. He worked on Gone with the Wind for two weeks. You know, so he was treated like a hand. I think I think I'll be showing them some letters, re reading from the letters, showing the, showing them pictures at least of the artifacts, um, and y yeah, again, the kids kind of reminded me not to just sort of be so dismissive almost of the intensity of Gatsby's feeling. Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Another I, old student. I yes, mean, I, I'm not the one who didn't like Gatsby. No, no. <laughs> Uh, c can you tell us anything about Max Perkins uh, and what changes he made and how important they were? Oh my God, he, he Max Perkins. I mean, I, I I had a wonderful editor for this book, and I compared her to Max Perkins, and I didn't do that lightly. Max Perkins, if you if you haven't read um, the great biography of Max Perkins, go buy it now. we I'm sure. Politics and Prose has has um, has some copies, and of course I'm blanking on the author's name because, yes, Scott Berg, A. Scott Berg, thank you. Um, it's wonderful. I mean, he's at the heart of of American literature in in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s. Um, it, it, it's of course it's not just Fitzgerald; it's also Hemingway, it's Thomas Wolfe. He's the editor for, and Fitzgerald when he was start he. Fitzgerald got discharged from the army in 1919. He had written uh, This Side of Paradise, and it had gotten rejected by Scribner's. He rewrites it. He sends it in again. Scribner's rejects it a second time. Fitzgerald gets discharged from the army. He goes to New York to try to make it as a short story writer. He works for the, for the advertising um, business while he's there, you know, as his day job. And after six months, he moves back to St. Paul to his parents' attic, basically, to rewrite uh, This Side of Paradise for the third time. I try to put myself in Fitzgerald's parents' place and think about <laughs> this guy who, their son, who basically got kicked out of Princeton, serves in the army, and then is rewriting this novel that's going nowhere and moves back home. And you think, talk about boomerang kids, right? 
when Fitzgerald sent This Side of Paradise in for the third time to Scribner's, Maxwell Perkins said he would quit at an editorial meeting if Scribner's didn't publish it. That's the kind of editor he was, you know? He believed in literature, and he believed in, obviously, putting his own job at the, on the line for literature. Um, there are so many editorial changes that he made for Gatsby and so many suggestions that uh, I'm not going to go through them all because it would be too tedious. But if the biggest change that Fitzgerald made was that um, the famous end of Gatsby, the ethereal ending of Gatsby, what the critic Jonathan Yardley has called the best seven pa final seven pages in all of American literature, and, I, and he's right. So and that and that final paragraph. So we beat on boats against the current, borne back ceaselessly into the past. They were at the end of chapter one. Go online and get onto Princeton University Library's website, and you will see the manuscript copy of The Great Gatsby floating digitally for your enjoyment, and you'll see that the end of Gatsby is at the end of chapter one. So that was a huge change that that he made. Yeah. It's a very Frank Sinatra way of asking a question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I wonder what you think about, uh, about Nick Carraway. And, and it seems to me, you know, obviously Nick is telling the yeah. story, but there's also a kind of an implication that he, he has chosen to tell us this story because it says something about him too, yeah. and that there's a connection. He's a kind of double of yeah, Gatsby's. Yeah, yeah. I have to. I have to out you, Elaine. <laughs> El Elaine Showalter taught Fitzgerald for for years and years at Princeton. She's one of our eminent literary critics and scholars. So um, I'm honored that you <laughs> that you would ask me that question. <laughs> And she's quoted in my book. <laughs> so she's a ringer. Yeah, Nick Carraway. Well, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of like the purloined letter in Poe's story of that name. It's, right, it's staring you in the face. There's his name. He's carried away by Gatsby. And, uh, and we have to wonder, why is that? Why is he so carried away by Gatsby? This, I think this is a novel in which the most intense love is between two men, at least, you know, Nick's, on Nick's part, reaching for Gatsby, who's eternally out of reach. By the way, that's another way in which the novel is over-designed. Everybody in the novel is reaching for somebody who's going to be out of reach forever. Um, I, I take Nick at his word, not always, because he's kind of unreliable, but at his word when he says... Um, Gatsby was all right in the end, that it wasn't him, it was the what foul dust preyed upon him that was, you know, dirty and sordid. I, I guess if somebody has learned something in the novel that's quote-unquote positive, I think Gatsby raises, raises Nick's sights. He makes him more of an idealist than he is at the beginning of the novel, I, I think. If, if, you know, but... And, and it's a coming-of-age story, in a sense, for Nick, too. He's wised up about other people, and he's wised up a bit about himself. But, but Gatsby is the one pure object, you know, the man he'll never be, too, I think. So I, I guess I do see that as the romantic aspect of the novel that's undimmed at the end. Nick is going to be telling that story of the summer of 1922 for the rest of his life. You know, he's like Ishmael in Moby Dick. He's the survivor who tells the tale. And, and later you can share your theories with me. <laughs> no, I think that's great. <laughs> yes? what they thought the book. yeah what they thought um, I think it's so interesting that that Fitzgerald was canny enough to say women drive the fiction market 
And because that's a that's what we all say these days. Men read nonfiction, women read fiction. And and yet he had enough integrity not to put a sympathetic female character in there, right? Yeah. He could have done that. Mm. Yeah. Uh, I guess this side. Why do you think it makes a bad first impression? You said you didn't like it at first. I, I think for me, I read it in high school, and I think when we read in high school, a lot of times we're looking for ourselves. You know, we're, lo we're looking to understand ourselves more. And it felt like there was nobody in this novel I could connect to. Um, it's not a character-driven novel. You know, the character, the character whose name graces the title of the novel is the absent center. In fact, Edith Wharton said to F. Scott Fitzgerald in a letter after she read Gatsby, I like it a lot, but you should have done more with Gatsby. You know, you should have given him his, a backstory or something. Um, and it doesn't mean that I, I just identified with pe you know, characters who exactly looked like me, but there was nobody I could hold on to here. I think... It's not a character-driven novel. It's not particularly a plot-driven novel. It's a voice-driven novel. And that's harder. That's a harder sell when I'm reviewing on air for fresh air because you've got to quote a lot. It's, it, it also sounds like one of these ethereal novels that people won't connect with. So I think that that's one of the reasons why students are also a little leery of it. And... You know, thanks to Baz Luhrmann and the countless other interpreters of, of Gatsby who've done an ich job, a lot of people think it's just about the 20s and all that jazz. And, and it's, you know, frothy and sparkly, and, and that's about it. So I, I think it has a lot to overcome. By the way, if you ha you know, I don't know if it's still on Netflix. I had to watch the 1949 Alan Ladd version at the Library of Congress, which was great because it was a reel-to-reel -reel pro uh, projector and, uh, and a white-gloved assistant had to come and keep putting the reels on. And uh, it was the perfect way to watch it in a sense. But I love the Alan Ladd version. It's fun and it's, it's down and dirty. So I recommend it. Well, that was actually going to be my question, so I'll make it another part okay. in terms of film. Well, what was your first one? But how would you cast Gats, the great Gatsby? Oh, man. I, I had the distinction of taking her to the Buzz Lerman and falling asleep. <laughs> <laughs> Which was the right response, I think. I think this is a film that leaves out the most important line about Daisy. Her voice was full of money. He does, he, he, it's out because he wants to have the, the love story. Um, I would cast it the way Gats did it uh, off Broadway. I would, I would, Gats was this wonderful seven hour production where actors who had basically memorized the novel performed it on a set that was from a 1970s type office. The opening scene is the Nick Carraway character comes into the office, sits down, his old boxy computer won't work, he opens a desk drawer, and there's a battered copy of The Great Gatsby. That actor, by the way, Scott Shepard, who I spoke to for the book, has to be the human being who's read, in, a, in quotes, The Great Gatsby more than any other human being alive, including F. Scott Fitzgerald. And it's such a thrill to talk to him because no matter what section of the novel you're talking about, he stops and he starts quoting it. <laughs> and he's a scholar of the novel, too. He's, he's amazing. But you have no actors in mind? Well, how about if I... Eh, no. no okay. uh, how, how about if I give you Fitzgerald's vote? Oh, well, that's When Fitzgerald thing. was in Hollywood, he had an actor in mind who he wanted to cast as Gatsby. He wanted to get another film made. Clark Gable. Oh. <laughs> that's a... And here, and here's something. A damn on that one. No, no. <laughs> here's something we can all search for the next time you're in an archive. When they were on the Riviera in that fateful during that fateful summer of 1924, and Fitzgerald was rewriting Gatsby, he says in a letter to Max Perkins that he's not seeing him clearly enough, and so he has Zelda, who was an artist, make portraits mm. of Gatsby. Mm. over and over again until her hands are ready to fall off. Where are they? 
I think right. somebody could make a good literary detective story about that one. <laughs> two, more. two more, okay. So um, one of the things that, I, oh, I'm sorry. Is it, what, one of the things that I wondered was how um, your reviewing books now has changed given how many reviewers missed how fabulous great Gatsby Well, was. I talk about that in the book. I, I try to imagine myself back in 1925 I get about 200 books a week delivered to my front porch from publishers hoping for a review on Fresh Air. And a lot of times, you know, you open up these book mailers and I say, oh, another dog book. Or these days, there are so many Downton Abbey related books, you know, about aristocracy, life in the great houses of England. You know, it's like, oh, God. So, uh, <laughs> so I think about... If I had opened up Gatsby and I think, okay, Fitzgerald was known for writing about flappers and their boyfriends and kind of that sort of thing. And I might have opened it up and thought, oh, it's thin. It's got this weird title that doesn't grab me. Do I really feel like reading another Fitzgerald? What I want to think is that the cover would have made me stop and think there might be something strange in this book. Because the cover, the original cover, the, the Francis Cougat cover, the disembodied flapper's face floating in that night sky over an amusement park. This is the only book jacket Francis Cug Francisco Cougat ever did, and he was paid $100 for it by Scribner's, who almost who threw it out, and then somebody fished it out of Scribner's pile of dead matter. You know, so talk about almost losing that. Kugat really got, this, got the message that this novel is about yearning for something that's out of reach. I think maybe the cover would have made me open it, and I want to hope that Nick Carraway's voice would have carried me through, because I, I, I look for something that grabs me about a novel, and voice is certainly one of those things. So I want to hope that I wouldn't be like that anonymous reviewer for the New York World who said, Fitzgerald's latest, a dud, and thought they were being clever. Who knows? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Since this is a hometown crowd, yes. and I noticed that you dedicated it to Rich and Molly. My uh, husband and daughter. <laughs> who are cringing. Um, I wanted to know, since you're a working mom and uh, a teacher and a scholar as well as uh, a mom, um, how did your family get involved in this project, or how did they help drive the project? How did they help? Even drive though Molly's the really embarrassed, <laughs> <laughs> they said, "Finish that book already. Finish that." No, well, one of the reasons why I started the book is because my husband and I went to see Gats on Thanksgiving Eve, 2010. He had lucked into tickets. The soul, it, was a, it was the hit of the 2010 theater season in New York. No tickets were to be had. He managed to get tickets that somebody had returned. They returned them because it was Thanksgiving Eve. You know, who goes to the theater and then tries to get back to Washington uh, from New York on the eve of Thanksgiving? So we went on a Greyhound bus up and back because that, that was the only way we could get back at 5 in the morning for Thanksgiving, which was at our house. Um, <laughs> but uh, when, when we left the theater... I was babbling, as I am now, and Rich said, this is the book you should write. This, you, you love Gatsby, you should write this book. And I said, right, there are like 40 trillion books about Gatsby. But I started writing about it, and I gave, it to my, I gave an essay to my agent. And this, this isn't you know, patting myself on the back. The shock of that book proposal was that nine publishing houses bid on it. And when I spoke to the editors who were bidding on the book, they didn't, they didn't particularly want to talk about my book. I mean, they didn't know what it was going to be like. I had just given them an essay. They wanted to talk about Gatsby. It was wonderful because you really got the sense that all of these editors <laughs> were old English majors <laughs> who really <laughs> wanted to talk about Gatsby. And so we had conversations about, for instance, whether Don Draper on Mad Men, is he a Gatsby, you know, stuff like that. Um, so, and then we went on some excursions together, Rich, Molly, and I went on the 
floating tourist trap of the Great Gatsby Boat Tour of Long Island. So, um, and my daughter was reading Gatsby as I was writing it. She was reading it for the first time. So it all bleeds in together. <laughs> One more question, I think. The million dollar question. <laughs> there are so many answers. Um, of course, a lot of, in, in classrooms, a lot of students get hung up on the color green. So we can talk about green equals money, green equals go straight ahead. Uh, green in medieval literature is always associated with uh, the supernatural, the uncanny. So there's there's that aspect to it. At the end of the novel, you have that, you know, the amazing end, right? In which the Dutch explorers are laying eyes on the fresh green breast of the new world for the first time, which conflates Daisy almost with the promise of America. So there, there are a lot of, um, there's so many possible interpretations of that light. But as I said, for me, it's not so much the green light, it's that Gatsby is reaching for it that that's the key symbol. And if you go to the end of the novel, Nick, to, to tie into Elaine's comment be earlier, Nick Carraway mimics Gatsby's gesture. He's reaching out to, at, at the end when he's standing in the darkened, um, on the dark, darkened shoreline looking at Gatsby's house. He's standing in the dark kind of reaching out as well. So everybody's, every. I mean, that's, that's our essential American gesture, right? That's the best of us. We reach. We want to run faster, reach higher, be better. That's, that to me is the important image there. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>